All right, here's a vulnerable version of GitLab running on my machine. Now, if I add a maliciously crafted URL as the URL to mirror a repository and wait for a couple of seconds, bam, just like that, we've hacked the GitLab server. Pretty cool, right? Now, what just happened here? How do we get the code execution on a GitLab server? To understand what's actually going on, we need to start with SSRFs. SSRF stands for Server Side Request Forgery. It literally means what it stands for. Basically, it's a vulnerability where you can make a server make arbitrary requests to anywhere you want. Kind of like, you know, when you were young and you wanted those beers, but you were underaged. So you'd ask someone who's older to get it for you while you wait outside the store. Yeah, that's pretty much what's going on, but with computers. But how could this be a problem? Because there are a lot of websites out there that has this feature built in, like webhooks or screenshotting other websites and things like that, right? So how exactly is this a problem? Well, sure, making requests server-side can be a feature, but also a problem. Here's how. Let's say you have a web application uh, that takes screenshots of other websites. It's all nice and fun until someone starts making requests to your internal services. Oftentimes, complex web applications use, you know, a lot of different services to function properly. Like, for example, a database or an in-memory store like Redis or whatever, or even sometimes a search engine like Elasticsearch. These services are used by your web application, but never exposed to your, you know, internet directly. Uh, only the main web application is exposed so that people can talk to it. But these other services are kind of hidden behind. So they're only accessible via the internal network. But what happens when someone tries to make a screenshot or take a screenshot of an internal service by providing in a localhost URL like this? Well, if there is no protections against it or no checks, it will go ahead and make a request to this internal service running on port whatever, one, two, three, four. See the problem yet? If one could talk to internal services like Redis or Elasticsearch or whatever, and also if they could somehow smuggle commands through HTTP or other protocols, they could do pretty serious damage. Anyways, usually uh, devs try to mitigate the SSRF issue by placing in some kind of checks, like checking an IP address is not equal to local host or something like that. But I've seen researchers break these checks and bypass them quite often because parsing URLs can be hard, pretty hard, yeah. There's, you know, always inconsistency in how URL is uh, parsed in different libraries and different languages. Kind of hard, man. If you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, there's a old talk, but still it's a pretty great uh, talk by Orange on SSRF. I'll leave the links in the uh, description. Go ahead and check it out. All right, now let's get to the real meat. I'm going to go over different concepts like protocol smuggling, uh, but I think it's better understood with an example. So let's basically hack GitLab. So Live Overflow has already done a great video on this. Uh, we both wrote a uh, blog post on it as well. Go ahead and check it out if you haven't already. Uh, but here we're going to go over the same exploit, but we're going to start from zero uh, and get a working exploit. But we'll go over every single detail uh, so you, you know basically know what goes into an SSRF exploit. So what is GitLab, first of all? I'm just going to read what it says on their actual page uh, or repository. Um, GitLab is an open source end-to-end -end software development platform with built-in version control, issue tracking, code review, CICD, blah, blah, blah. Um, Self-host GitLab on your own servers, in containers, or in cloud providers. Um, well, that sums it up. <laughs> it's basically a version control platform. You can store code, have, uh, you know, multiple teams work on it, have uh, DevOps integrated into the actual platform. It's kind of like everything in a single platform, but whatever. That's what we're going to try to hack today. Now let's set up GitLab using Docker. Here's the uh, Docker Compose file to spin up the GitLab CE. 
As you can see, we have a bunch of uh, volumes required, so we can create those in current directory so the container can use it. Uh, you also need a password and a flag, so we're going to create some dummy ones. Um, and finally, we're going to spin up this container, which is going to be a single container where GitLab and other services like Redis is going to run. Now, all we have to do is just do docker compose up and wait till it finishes. Now we're done with the setup, uh, we can visit localhost 5080 and pretty much get to the actual page. Now we can register the account and continue. So let's get to the exploitation bit. The SSRF we talked about exists in a bunch of different places like where you import a repo by URL or webhooks or mirroring a repo by URL. So we'll, we'll use that one. Uh, we'll exploit in the mirroring a repo feature because it's a lot easier. Anyways, here's how the exploit is gonna work. We'll use the SSRF vulnerability to make GitLab talk to one of its internal services. And this internal service is gonna be Redis. And we're gonna try to somehow smuggle Redis commands into Redis through the Git protocol. So how does this Git protocol work? The easiest way to understand this is to actually set up a Netcat server and use a Git client to talk to it and see what it actually sends. As you can see, it sends plain text. Remember that this is what the Redis sees. It's not valid Redis commands, but this is what it actually sees and also executes. Redis strictly takes one line as a command uh, if we want to have multiple commands, which we will in our exploit, we will need to add a lot more new lines at the end so that our commands actually work. So let's try that out. We're going to add some new lines, which are URL encoded. And there you go. You can see those new lines actually work. And Redis tries to execute each line one after the other. Of course, the first line is going to give us an error because it's not valid Redis command, but it don't matter because Redis continues to execute other commands even if the old ones actually fail. Great, now we have full control over Redis. We can issue any command we want. By the way, those new lines should have been filtered by GitLab, but it just didn't do that. Hence, this is a um, CRLF injection bug or carriage return and line feed injection, which is great to have, right? It actually makes the SSRF exploitable in this case. All right, now that we can execute any commands we want on Redis, let's get to the full code execution. All right, so let's try to start with a simple test. I'll try to make uh, an SSRF request to a local host on a random port using the Git protocol. I'll get inside the container and run netcat server on this random port so that we can, you know, listen for requests. If we get a request, that means the SSRF works and we can talk to internal services from the outside. Now let's try this out. I'll also add some new lines, which are URL encoded. All right, so now let's, uh, let's try this thing out. And it seems to work. Also notice our new lines work too. Awesome, sweet. Now let's actually talk to Redis. Redis usually runs on port 6379. If we search for services that are running in the container using the uh, netstat, you'll see a bunch of services that are running and one of them is Redis. Pretty cool. Now there are different ways to get code execution if you talk to a Redis instance. You can dump the database in any folder you want and overwrite some of the other files like overwrite authorized keys and get in via SSH or overwrite one of the files in the cron tab or even overwrite files like PHP or some other uh, server-side templates to get code execution. But that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do something different. We're going to find gadgets or simply make use of uh, existing code as our helpers to get code execution. You see, GitLab doesn't just use Redis as a simple key value store. It uses Redis to push jobs that will be processed later by the Ruby interpreter. So the idea is to push our own malicious job onto the queue in Redis and wait for Ruby to run it. After that, all we got to do is just wait for our sweet shell. The gadget we're going to be using was found by Jobert from um, HackerOne. Uh, shout out to Jobert or Yobert. Thanks, man. 
This is how it looks like. This is a set of Redis commands that will be executed after we talk to our Redis. So there's different parts to it. Let's start off with the first one, which is the multi. So multi is a block, which is a transaction block. It's called a transaction block because all the commands that come inside of it are going to be queued and executed uh, atomically. And at the end, you just put exec so that everything runs. Then we use sadd to add a value to a set. And then we do an L push, which inserts the value at the head of the list. Uh, and finally, we have the actual payload, uh, which is going to be pushed onto the queue. And this is a simple string or a JSON, but it's stringified. Anyways, GitLab uses something called as rescue. And you might have seen it right there. Rescue is a Ruby library uh, for scheduling jobs uh, on Redis and executing them or processing them later on. And GitLab uses it. Now, the requirements for a job is that it needs a worker class. And this worker class has to have basically a method called perform. So when you push a job onto the queue, it will pick the worker class and execute a perform method inside of it. So our goal is to find a class that has a perform method in it, but also that perform method can be abused in some way. So here in this example, we're looking at a GitLab shell worker class. And if you go to that class, you'll see that it has the perform method and it takes any action that it wants and also the arguments and basically send it over to a send function. And the send function basically is used for dynamic function calls, I believe in Ruby. I'm sorry, I don't know much about Ruby. I just learned it last night. Uh, if, you, if I make mistakes, please let me know in the comments down below. But anyways, the underscore send method is going to execute a function that you want. You provide the function name or a symbol and the different arguments for it. And it, it's basically going to execute it for you. So in our case, what we're going to do is call the class underscore eval function. And the class eval function is simply an eval function with the context of a class or context of the current class, which is the GitLab shell worker. All right, awesome. So we have everything we need. So all we got to do now is to create a URL with Git protocol and the IP address, which is localhost and the port number uh, to our Redis server. After that, in the path, we're just going to put the actual payload because the path is going to be sent straight to the actual Redis instance and uh, URL is going to be decoded. So we'll have our new lines and um, everything will work, hopefully. <laughs> So all we got to do is just sit back and wait for it. Also, by the way, as a proof of concept, I'm going to be uh, running the ID command and I'll send the output to a URL uh, just to see uh, if I get back the response. If I do, that's basically um, RCE. Awesome. So we got our uh, code execution by chaining SSRF and CRLF. Anyways, I'll leave a link to the uh, Docker Compose and instructions down below if you want to try it, try and check it out. I hope this gave some kind of a walkthrough on how the SSRF exploits actually work uh, and what goes into creating one. All right, that's all for me. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.